That, uh, that young man is gifted, isn't he? Uh, yeah, to play like that is a gift. But it is a gift that also requires a lot of effort and work, and he's put in his time, and you can tell how beautiful that was. Well, first of all, I'd like to commend Pastor Austin for having the courage to go into the women's restroom to get that phone. Man, and to live to tell about it. That's amazing. Well, I hope you're doing great. The folks in the first service kind of slid in this morning, and looks like conditions may have improved somewhat. I'm glad you're here today. Uh, I'm having a little issue with gout. It comes and visits me once in a while, and the most dreaded times for it to come is when I want to golf or when I, when I want to preach in, in that order. So I'm a little limpy and gimpy, somewhat of a wounded warrior this morning, but I, to be honest with you, there's nothing I'd rather be doing than what I'm doing right now, no place I'd rather be in doing it than right here. I am so thankful to God for this privilege. I... Uh, I had a little flashback of one Sunday morning when I was pastoring, oh, eons ago in uh, Sioux City, Iowa, when a lady came in that morning and she, she coughed and she sniffled and then she blew out a very impressive sneeze. And I said, uh, being astute as I am, I said, oh, you have a cold. She said, I do not. I only have the symptoms. Oh. You know, sometimes I can be really tactful, uh, and sometimes I don't want to be, and I didn't want to be. I said, well, the next time you sneeze, do you mind sneezing that direction instead of my direction so your symptoms don't become my symptoms? <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, look at it any way you want to. Uh, I may have gout. I may just have the symptoms this morning, but the end result it feels pretty much the same. Let's turn in God's Word today. We want to talk about... Uh, uh, what James shares with us in such direct language and such practical language. In James chapter 4, we're continuing our series, going through the letter of James. James, this half-brother of Jesus, and just think of all the things James could talk about. And yet he chooses to talk about where the rubber hits the road where we live. And our text today, no exception to that. He gets very direct and very practical. He says in James chapter 4, I'm just going to read verse 6 through 10, and I encourage you to, if you have your Bible with you today, uh, keep it open before you as we reference James' words. Verse 6, but he gives us more grace. Now, what an entry point for this text. You can't afford to forget that. This is an unveiling of God. God is good. He's merciful. He's full of grace. And He gives us more grace. And the tense is that He, he keeps on giving us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud you don't want to be on the receiving end of what God opposes or who God opposes. God opposes the proud but shows favor or gives grace, as I believe the King James Version says, to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. These emphatic statements, staccato statements, resist the devil and He will flee from you. Come near to God. He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. Today I want to talk to you about an enemy we all face. I mean every single one of us. None of us are safe or secure from this enemy. Just when you think it's been defeated, it shows up again. This enemy has been around forever. 
And this enemy can never be taken lightly. This enemy has brought down some of the biggest names of the church in church history. This enemy has even invaded the inner sanctum of heaven and changed angels into demons. This enemy is not without, but within. And as deadly and destructive as it is, it is rarely mentioned. The enemy of which I speak is pride. Like the word sin, pride has an eye right in the middle of it. Now, I come here today fully aware this is not going to be popular preaching. I got up this morning knowing I'd probably be the most unpopular preacher in town today. I got up and put on my suit. You know, a few weeks ago, pastor said you shouldn't dress to impress people. And I don't. It just happens. And um, <laughs> speaking of pride. And I put on my suit, and I, I put in my hanky, and I, and I came here today <laughs> to be unpopular. But you know, whenever, whenever, whenever you're concerned about that, I, I remember a man named Latimer. Latimer lived in the 1500s. He's a close personal friend of mine. <laughs> Latimer was an early church reformer who had his share of triumph and tragedy courage and cowardice and fame and infamy. And he invented, uh, he eventually suffered as a martyr, in fact, giving his life for the gospel. Well, on one occasion, Latimer was preaching, and when he looked out, he saw King, King Henry was present. And he knew good and well he was about to say something that the king would not like. So in the pulpit, he played out a soliloquy. He said it out loud. He said, Latimer, 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 be careful what you say. Henry, the king, is here. And then he paused and he said, Latimer, 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 be careful what you say. The king of kings is here. And when we preach, we preach in the presence of the king of kings. We preach as those who are ultimately accountable to Him. So though it may not be popular preaching, it is imperative preaching. And my pray to, uh, prayer today is that we will see pride for what it is. And in God's Word, we will find spirit-given motivation for living lives away from pride's influence out from under pride's jurisdiction. I have two very simple points today. The first one is, let's look at pride's burden. I could spend all day talking about pride in our world. We see it everywhere we look. You can turn on Christian television and you can see pride, arrogance, entitlement. Pride is everywhere. Pride didn't originate in Washington, D.C., but it seems to have a headquarters there. I could talk about the pride of the rebel that prevents one from bowing the knee and confessing Jesus as Lord. The pride that dismisses God and replaces Him with self. But the pride I want to talk about today does not involve the world, but the church. Not the sinner, but the saint. Now, surely there is pride in a good sense, pride that rejoices in God's goodness and flows back to Him in thanksgiving. Paul talks about boasting in the Lord. He even boasted about some of his fellow Christians. But there is a pride that forgets God, a pride that replaces him with self-sufficiency that chooses to go through life without him. And when that kind of pride moves in, a person becomes unteachable, unreachable, unapproachable, unaccountable, they become a little God who sees others as inferior and themselves entitled, entitled to special treatment from God and man. There are two things we ought to know about pride here, and the sooner we learn them, the better our lives will be. Sometimes we learn them the hard way, much better to learn them by simple observation and obedience. 
And the first one is, believe it or not, God opposes the proud. I want you to look for three pictures in this text, three pictures of God's hand, three beautiful, simple, direct images of God's hand. And here you have the first one. It is a picture of God's hand resisting the proud. It says so in verse 6. This is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud. God resisteth the proud, the King James says. You know, the proud can, the proud can never get close to God. Oh, they may claim they are, but it's only a matter of their pride deceiving them. They can never get close to God because they'll never get past His hand holding them at arm's length. God opposes, resists, resists the proud. So the proud have a barrier between them and God, and that barrier is God's very hand. Think about it. Where did pride originate? It came from Lucifer himself. In fact, Isaiah chapter 14 chronicles his fall and reveals that it all began with his pride. Lucifer, this anointed cherub, this archangel got too big for his whatever archangels wear. And he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Instead, God took him down. And the day is coming when God will take him out. God opposes the proud. He's in opposition to the proud, and he will crush the proud. And when your life is dominated by pride, you have become God's enemy. And God's enemies never win. Another lesson about pride here is that pride always leads to destruction. Pride always leads to a fall, and a fall will always be the result of pride. When pride rules, you know it's going to be a sad and bad ending. The Proverbs gives us warning after warning about the fallout from pride. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2 says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. Here comes pride. What's that with him? What's always with him? Disgrace. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before what? A fall. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. The old Moody said, be humble or you'll stumble. It's cause and effect, sow and reap, action and reaction, conduct and consequence. And we see the Bible is replete with examples of fi, uh, pride and its inevitable result of a fall. Joseph was proud of his revelations and his coat of many colors. David was proud of his military victories. Jonah was proud of his nationalism and his racism. The rich young ruler was proud of his wealth. Saul gloried in his religious pedigree. Peter boasted of his capabilities. Herod was proud of his robe and his throne and his power. The Pharisees were proud of the relationship with God, and it was that very pride that kept them from a relationship with God. Every one of them brought down prison, curse, painful personal loss, humiliation, even death. Pride always exacts a penalty. The only people Jesus ever criticized were the proud people, people who wanted to do it their way instead of God's way, people who thought they were wiser than God, and there's sure a lot of them walking around today. 
we have pride's burden. Secondly, James directs our thoughts to humility's blessing. And again, look at that entry point for our text in verse 6. But he gives us more grace. Grace is the downreach of the divine. He gives us more grace. More than what? Well, more and more. He just keeps providing us with His grace. More than your sin. More than you could ever need. More than you deserve. It's always more. This must be an important truth because you find it in the Old Testament. You find it in the New Testament. It's one of the most repeated scriptures in the Bible. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Grace is God's favor and kindness, God's help and enablement. Grace is God's wisdom and His love in action. So now we have the second picture of God's hand. His hand resists or opposes the proud, but here His his hand reaches out and reaches down to give. His hand holds a blessing to be released and bestowed, a favor to impart. He gives grace to the humble. Now, which hand do you want to see in your life? Which hand do you want to see reaching toward you? He gives grace, more grace, and more grace. This is multifaceted grace. This is grace for living. He sustains us, enables us, provides for us by His grace. And surely it is grace for our salvation, for by grace are you saved. Now the proud man will never be saved by grace because he's chosen another route. He said, thanks God, but no thanks. He's chosen his own goodness rather than God's grace, his own human merit rather than divine mercy, salvation at his own hands rather than at the grace-giving hand of God. And if Jesus taught us anything, he taught us that. Remember the story he told of the tax collector and the Pharisee? The, The Pharisee was the one that looked like he had his act together. He was the one that was oh so religious. He had a long list of religious rules, and believe me, he abided by all of them. He said long prayers. What could be more impressive than that? He wore long robes. He even went around with a long face. He made a big show of his religiosity. Then there was a tax collector Jesus said, who was the most hated man in town, he collected taxes for Rome, and the Jews looked upon tax collectors as traitors, and they were. They were connivers and cheaters. You've got this religious man, the Pharisee, and you've got the tax collector. They both come to church. In fact, they both stood before the altar, and they both prayed. However, the Pharisee's prayers were just another manifestation of his pride. He stood up and he prayed. He stood up so everybody would see him. And he said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I thank you that uh, I'm not like the robbers and the adulterers and the evildoers. And he looks down at the altar and he sees the tax collector there and praying. He says, and even this tax collector. Why, God, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. What a nauseating prayer that was. And I can see God's hands, one resisting such self-righteousness and the other one holding his nose. At the other end of the altar, the hated tax collector also prayed. He was a sinner. He knew it. Everybody else knew it. But his prayer had a different tone. 
God didn't know him anything. His prayer was one of truth and honesty and humility. He could not even look up to heaven. The Bible says he, he beat his chest in his grief and his shame, his sorrow and his contrition, and he simply prayed, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, the story we are told was directed to those who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. Man, there's all kinds of pride, but religious pride is the worst kind of them all. Spurgeon said, be not proud of race, face, place, or grace. And Jesus said something that must have astonished his disciples. He said, I tell you that this man, the repentant tax collector, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We would probably say it like this, what goes up must come down, what goes down will be lifted up. There's a second blessing of humility here, and that is not only does God reach down, but God lifts up in verse 10. James says, humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. What beautiful bookends in this text. The first one in verse 6, he gives us more grace. And the end of it, in verse 10, he will lift you up. Now, here we have the third picture of God's hand. With the first one, he resists the proud. With the second one, he gives. And with the third picture, he lifts the humble. In grace, God stoops down, and he stoops down to lift up. Uh, this is one of the paradoxes of the gospel, and the gospel's full of them. Uh, if you want to live, you got to die. If you want to find life, you got to lose your life. If you want to get, you got to give. And the way up is down. Peter, if anybody had learned less, a lesson about pri pride the hard way, <laughs> I think it had to be Simon Peter. You remember his story. Jesus said, you guys are going to be in trouble. You guys are going to fail. You guys are going to falter. And Peter said, no, Lord, you got it all wrong, Lord. I don't mean to correct you, but let me correct you, Lord. He said, all these other guys, now they, they might fall, but not me, Lord. No, never. Oh, it must have grieved the heart of Jesus as he forecasted or prophesied to Peter, yeah, you too, son. In fact, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter was so full of shame and grief, so heartbroken. And the Lord restored him. The Lord made him one of the most exciting preachers of the gospel that's ever been born. And Peter wrote us two epistles. And in those epistles, guess what? He talks about pride, and he says the very same thing that James says. He says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. God's mighty hand can work against me. It can work for me. It can put me down. It can lift me up. It can heal me. It can kill me. My humility my dependency upon him, my submission to him assures the fact that his mighty hand will also be a merciful hand. You say, well, now I'm a little disturbed, preacher, because what does pride look like? How do I know when I got it? And I, I don't know. It is, it, I agree with you. It's, it's a difficult thing to pin down. When you think you got humility, chances are you don't. And they're both terms that are hard to nail down. But in this very chapter, verses 1 through 4, 
The proud person is pictured for us. James says he covets and quarrels and kills. He is so deceived by pride that he doesn't pray because he sees no need for God. And when he does pray, his motives are always self-serving. He's a mess, and his life is a mess. And he's so blinded by pride, he doesn't know he's the reason for the mess. In verses 13 through 26, the proud person just goes through life, taking life with all of its blessings and all of its joys for granted. He plans ahead with no thought of the God who holds tomorrow in his hand. He boasts, he brags about what he does, and yet he doesn't do the very things he should be doing. He's proud, and he's proud of it. And James, my friend, uses the most severe language. I must forewarn you. He uses the most severe language you will find in the Bible in telling us how to approach and attack pride in our lives. It takes my breath away. No punches pulled, no sugar coating, no tiptoeing here. Look at the admonitions here. Look at them and feel the depth of them. Read them and weep. Here's how the message presents this text in its paraphrased form. So let God work His will in you. Yell a loud no to the devil and watch him scamper. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom and cry your eyes out. The fun and games are over. Get serious, really serious. Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way you'll get on your feet. Anything less and anything else means you haven't seen how great God is and how great your sin is. So, how do you rise above pride? You don't. You kneel below it. Bring your intellect to the altar. Bring your accomplishments to the altar. Bring your wealth and influence to the altar. Bring your religion to the altar. Bring your blessings and life to the altar. Bring your ego to the altar. Well, uh, not too many amens this morning. As Sheriff Andy would say, not nary a one, barn. It's all right. Latimer, Latimer, be careful what you say. The king is here. Latimer, Latimer, be careful what you say. The king of kings is here. Let's pray. Our worship team is coming as we pray. The altar is open even as we pray. Lord, it's so easy for us to coast through life without self-examination, to coast through life with an arrogance, a cockiness that we're somebody, but without you we're nobody, and without you we can do nothing. We're so dependent upon you, Lord, and we don't resent that. We rest in that. We rejoice in that. So, Lord, give us a constant awareness of what we are and what you are and how the creation constantly needs its creator. My God, you were there when we were formed in our mother's womb. You made us. You put us together. You knit us. And you will be there at the end of our life. 
You've given us this gift of life, and what we do with it is our gift back to you, Lord. May it please you, honor you. May it take all the light and all the glory and shine it on you. Because everything we have is a gift from the God who, the Father who gives good and perfect gifts. Lord, when it's all stripped away, the prayer of our heart is so simple. I need Thee. I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee.